And now to introduce our final keynote speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Adrian Mayor, uh, who will be discussing. Pardon me, there's a. Who will be discussing biological and chemical warfare in ancient myth and history? Dr. Meyer is a classical folklorist and historian of ancient science, and she's the author of many books, including Flying Snakes and Griffin Claws, Greek Fire, Poison Arrows, and Scorpion Bombs. And she was invited to be a research scholar in the classic department in history and philosophy of the science and history and philosophy science program at Stanford University. Thanks so much. This is just a great honor for me to be invited to the SASA third annual conference. And uh, I want to thank the organizers for a fabulous conference so far. I really enjoyed the papers. And I also want to note that um, much of my research and writing uh, was done as an independent scholar uh, before I became affiliated with the university. So I really support uh, everything that, uh, that you're doing here. Um, my question today is just how ancient is biological and chemical warfare? And the answer is pretty surprising. Um, uh, I'm trying to move to my next screen, but it's uh, not moving. There we go. Um, I think the answer is very surprising for how ancient uh, bio biological and chemical warfare was and when it was first imagined and carried out in antiquity. Um, the roots of humans' genius for turning natural forces into weapons, they turn out to be much deeper and older than we might have imagined. Uh, most people, uh, and myself included, once assumed that biochemical warfare was a relatively recent in a, in innovation or invention. Surely the ability to turn poisons, germs, chemicals, and other dangerous natural agents into weapons, wouldn't that require a scientific understanding of toxicology, biology, epidemiology, and chemistry? And plus, wouldn't you need uh, advanced technology and sophisticated delivery systems? And besides, wasn't uh, we've all been taught or uh, we sometimes assume that warfare in antiquity was supposed to be based on honor, courage, skill in combat, and indeed many uh, modern historians have just assumed or taken for granted that poison weapons and unscrupulous, unfair tactics were forbidden by the ancient uh, rules of war. And with, with very few exceptions, uh, those rules were followed in, in uh, classical antiquity. But the evidence shows that despite uh, qualms and disapproval that, that did surround biological and chemical uh, tactics, there were no real formal rules of war forbidding them. Now, some uh, in the past have traced the first deliberate use of germ warfare to the Middle Ages, uh, when it was said that plague-ridden corpses were catapulted over city walls. And many of you probably already heard of that notorious episode in 1346, medieval period, when the Mongols, who were afflicted with bubonic plague, were besieging the fortified city of Kaffa on the Black Sea in the Crimea. And uh, it was said that as the Mongols uh, withdrew from the siege, it was said that they threw or catapulted bodies of their own dead soldiers from plague into the city with the intention of spreading the plague among the enemy. Now that incident is quite controversial and there are some uh, really good recent studies that point out that the Black Death was spread to Europe by ships leaving Kaffa, not uh, from catapulted corpses into the city. So whether or not the catapulting event really happened, however, the accusation and uh, the belief that it was plausible shows that such a tactic was thought to be possible and was feared at the time. And for a lot of ancient historians, the medieval episode brings to mind uh, the event in the fifth century BC when devastating plague broke out in Athens during the Peloponnesian War. And we know uh, from Thucydides that the Athenians' first impulse, their first reaction, was to blame the Spartans for deliberately uh, um, poisoning or tainting the Athenians' water supply with that disease. Now, 
Note that the des deliberate spread of contagious disease in antiquity, that wouldn't really require any formal scientific knowledge. Everyone knew in antiquity that proximity to victims of play uh, or even to their own clothing or possessions usually spelled uh, doom. And we do have concrete ancient evidence from Sumerian and Hittite cuneiform tablets that there was indeed a practical understanding of contagion and plague going back to about 1700 BC. We have tablets that warn against touching the belongings of plague victims. Other tablets uh, describe sending infected victims of plague, both animals and people, into enemy lands with the intention of spreading uh, the disease. Another surprising discovery to me was that the Romans even had a name for man-made epidemics, pestilentia manufacta. The term was used by Seneca and uh, Cassius Dio to describe two separate incidents in which terrorists were said to have poked or stuck people with needles that were inf inf uh, infected with plague. Uh, this was reported in AD 90 and then in uh, AD 189. And again, whether or not it really happened, that, that it was written about and that there was an accusation means that the concept was plausible and feared in antiquity. So we have uh, those two concepts of intention and plausibility. And as I delve further into the ancient literature looking for the roots of biological and chemical warfare, I learned that the ways of turning nature's armory uh, of uh, natural things to military use, they were not just imagined, but they were practiced much earlier and more extensively in the ancient world than has been realized. Um, it turns out that the ancient attitudes about gaining an unfair advantage uh, by using poisons and other sinister weapons, secret weapons, were complex and ambivalent. Underhanded secret strategies to avoid face-to-face -face combat entailed practical and uh, ethical problems. And that realization, that stands out even in the earliest myths about the invention of biological weapons. The concept of creating poison weapons is deeply embedded in Greek mythology. It was the great Greek hero Heracles, who uh, you could say started it all. In his second labor, Heracles set out to slay the Hydra, which was a poisonous serpent with many heads and fangs, all dripping venom. And Heracles' brute strength and his ordinary weapons were useless against the Hydra monster. Every time he chopped off one head, two more grew back. So to destroy this hundred-headed monster, Heracles finally did resort to fire, and he used a, a burning pine resin torch to cauterize each neck uh, before it could generate any more heads. But in the myth, the Hydra's central head was immortal, couldn't be destroyed. So Heracles chopped off that head and quickly buried it alive deep underground. And then he placed a huge stone over that spot. Um, this isn't the real boulder, but it'll stand for, for that uh, mythological boulder. Um, in antiquity, Greek and Roman travelers used to point out a big boulder on the road to Corinth as the place where Heracles had entombed the Hydra's horrible, indestructible head. And it was imagined as perpetually oozing venom underground, but at least it was trapped deep under the earth. And then after destroying the Hydra in the myth, Heracles dipped his arrows in its venom. And with that act, he invented the first biological weapon described in Western literature. But that's not all. It's remarkable to me that the ancient myth of Heracles' invention of poison arrows, it goes on to predict the practical and the ethical dilemmas that have surrounded the use of biological weapons since earliest time. Uh, the monstrous uh, hydra with its ever multiplying heads is a fitting symbol of the proliferating problems that are created by biological uh, and chemical agents of death uh, up through modern times. And even Heracles' way of disposing of the indestructible hydra head that has a modern counterpart. Today, we also resort to what scientists 
call the geological solution of getting rid of toxic weapons of mass destruction, for instance. We bury them deep in the earth under solid rock in the desert, like at Carlsbad, New Mexico, or in uh, the more controversial plan uh, for Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and many other places around the world. And we hope that no one will be harmed by the poisons that are continually seeping underground, something like the Hydra's head in the Greek myth. And the ancient Greeks already understood that by their very nature, biological and chemical weapons tend to be very difficult to control. Like the Hydra's head, uh, unexpected problems seem to proliferate and multiply, and the weapons seem to take on a life of their own. And the potential for friendly fire or uh, blowback, uh, collateral damage, that's always looming with these kinds of weapons. In the Greek myth, Heracles' invention of poison arrows set in motion a chain of unintended consequences. His new hydrovenom weapons accidentally killed several of his best friends. In the famous uh, battle against the centaurs, uh, one of Heracles' toxic arrows uh, pierced his oldest friend, uh, the wise old centaur named Chiron. And the pain for Chiron was so ghastly that in the mythology, Chiron begged the gods to let him trade his immortality for a quick death. And the next to die was another friendly centaur named Pholos. And while Heracles was tending to Chiron, the myth says that this young centaur curiously picked up Heracles' quiver of toxic arrows. And one of the arrows slipped from his hand and nicked his leg. It was just a scratch, but this centaur also died a gruesome death. And this was yet another and unintended victim of Heracles' poisoned weapons. Um, in the tragic chain of events, uh, as we know, Heracles himself was the ultimate victim of his own toxic weapons. The superhero did not die bravely in glorious combat on the battlefield. He succumbed to secondhand hydra arrow poisoning. His wife, Dianera, thinking she was applying a love potion, unwittingly soaked his tunic in the poisoned blood of a centaur that had been shot with a hydra arrow. And in antiquity, there was a famous statue of Heracles uh, in, that, uh, in that burning uh, toxic uh, tunic. And this is a more uh, modern uh, uh, version of that ancient lost statue uh, made in 1676. Heracles' invention of poison arrows and his own agonizing death in that envenomed tunic, that was a favorite subject in art and tragic drama, uh, both ancient and modern, as you can see. And in the Greek myth, just before Heracles died, he entrusted his quiver of poison arrows to his young friend, the great archer Philoctetes, who would later fight uh, in, the, in, in the Trojan War. And this is a vase painting showing the dying Heracles handing over his fatal quiver, uh, quiver of poison arrows to Philoctetes uh, while he is on his funeral pyre. But the biological weapons brought suffering to this warrior too. On the way to the legendary Trojan War, Philoctetes dropped one of the poison arrows on his foot in uh, one of the versions of the myth. And this is another friendly fire accident. Uh, the wound was extremely painful and it festered, got worse and worse. Um, and this incident, right at the start of the Trojan War, as the Greeks are heading to Troy, was taken as very bad omen by the Greeks. So uh, the Greeks abandoned their wounded companion, the archer Philoctetes, on a desert island, and they continued on to Troy without him. And there are many uh, ancient and modern images of uh, the young archer Philoctetes stranded on the island with his never healing poison wound in his foot. Uh, this vase was made in about 450 BC. This myth seems to uh, present a kind of moral lesson of poetic justice. Uh, just like Heracles, who died by his own poison weapons, the young archer who tended to use these uh, arrows against the Trojans uh, himself suffers a terrible wound from his own arrow. And this ironic tragedy was quite popular into ancient art and drama. Uh, we know that Sophocles wrote a, a compelling play about this myth in the fifth century BC, and this classic tragedy appealed to modern uh, artists too. Uh, this is a French painting from 1768. 
showing Philoctetes uh, with his wounded uh, foot um, and that ominous quiver of poison arrows hanging above him. After surviving 10 years of torturing pain, Philoctetes did finally arrive in Troy, where the war had been dragging on for a decade. Um, the Greek doctors there uh, did cure his, his wound in the myth, and the expert archer began killing Trojans with his bow. So the ultimate Greek victory at Troy uh, was, thanks in part, to a quiver full of hydrovenom arrows. And of course, combined with the more clever, uh, more famous uh, ruse of the Trojan horse, which was thought of by another great archer who liked underhanded tricks, Odysseus. Homer doesn't uh, come up right out and talk about poison arrows in the Iliad. But another ancient author, Quintus of Smyrna, uh, later, explicitly described the poison arrows that were used by both Greeks and Trojans in his poem, The Fall of Troy, which was based on an earlier lost epic from the Homeric time. And even Homer gives us strong hints that projectiles on both sides were poisoned with snake venom. For example, he describes black blood oozing from the wounds on the battlefield at Troy. And he uh, talks about doctors rushing onto the battlefield to suck out the wounds. And that was the standard treatment for snake bite. His audience would have realized that. Well, even without Homer's hints though, his Greek audience knew that, uh, they knew the story of Philoctetes, uh, that he had inherited Heracles' toxic arrows, and they knew about his uh, accident on the way to Troy, and they also knew uh, a tale of Heracles' own son, Telephus. Telephus also suffered a friendly fire injury on the way to Troy, and this happened when he tripped and fell against the spear being carried by the great warrior Achilles. And Telephus's wound never healed. Telephus suffered for years, just like Philoctetes. In the myth, his poison wound was finally healed with rust scraped from the original uh, uh, wounding agent from Achilles' spear. And here we see uh, an image of that from uh, ancient and modern times. Rust or bronze uh, patina was one of the many antidotes used for poison war wounds in antiquity. And uh, notably, archeologists have found kits uh, uh, that were used by uh, field medics in Rome on the battlefield that contain supplies of rust. The myth of Telephus suggests that even the noble Greek champion Achilles apparently treated his spear with some noxious, noxious substance. And in Homer's Iliad, Achilles himself was destroyed, as we know, by an arrow that struck his heel. And that was supposed to be the only vulnerable place in his body. But now, if you stop to think about it, that detail in the myth is a strong hint of the fatal arrow must have been steeped in poison because normally a wound in the heel would be a superficial injury, unless the point somehow delivered poison into Achilles' bloodstream. The main character of Homer's uh, epic poem, The Odyssey, the wily hero Odysseus, we know he, we have clear evidence that he used poison weapons because uh, in the Greek myth, uh, we know that uh, Odysseus was a master of unconventional warfare and Homer in the Odyssey describes Odysseus traveling to Western Greece specifically uh, for the purpose of finding a special plant poison to put on his arrows. And uh, the local king, strongly criticized Odysseus for poisoning his arrows. But classical scholars uh, suggest that it was hellebore uh, that, he, that Odysseus was looking for, a uh, very common plant in Western Greece. And uh, that of course, isn't the only possibility. Uh, a great variety of poison plants uh, was known to the ancients. Arrows were sometimes treated with the highly toxic monk's hood, which is also known as Aconite, and this is a hillside uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey that is covered with monk's hood or aconite, another common, common plant in, around the Mediterranean. And aconite has been used on uh, weapons around the world wherever it occurs. Henbane, yew, uh, hemlock, oleander, deadly nightshade, belladonna. These are just uh, some of the many lethal arrow drugs that are mentioned in ancient 
uh, Greek and Roman texts. Well, one of the favorite lessons of Greek myths is whatever goes around comes around. So it should come uh, as no surprise to learn that Odysseus, uh, according to uh, ancient legend, died uh, from a wound inflicted by another ingenious biological weapon. According to legend, Odysseus was accidentally stabbed by a spear tipped with the poisonous spine of a stingray. Homer's uh, passage about Odysseus poisoning his arrows and then the local king's objections, I think that's a really perfect uh, incident that reveals the ancient tensions about what was fair in warfare. In a traditional warrior society like ancient Greece or Rome, honorable face-to-face -face fighting with swords or spears was highly valued. Um, the warriors expected to meet uh, uh, similarly armed and trained uh, warriors on the battlefield. But the Greeks and Romans also admired creative sneaky tactics like those uh, brought up, uh, thought of by Odysseus. Well, I've been focusing on all these mythical stories because they show that the idea, the concept of making biological weapons is extremely ancient. And they also reveal the complex attitudes toward weapons that delivered his hidden uh, poison or took some sort of unfair advantage. As the myths show, biological weapons tended to destroy innocent bystanders. Um, they could suddenly turn against a person or your companions. Uh, besides collateral damage, they could cause suffering far beyond what was expected with traditional weapons. And if you think about this, you don't even have to be a skilled archer to use poison arrows because um, a simple nick or scratch could kill or cause lifelong suffering. Poison weapons, they really sort of cancel out the courage and the skill of warriors who expected to face equally armed foes in a fair fight. So toxic weapons really allowed one to take life without taking risk. And as I say, so far I've been talking about myths, uh, but killing enemies by borrowing the destructive forces of nature was not just a fantasy spun uh, by myth makers. Biological and chemical warfare was actually carried out. Um, it's documented in ancient sources. And I found more than uh, 50 ancient authors who provide some evidence uh, that a remarkable array of biological and chemical weapons uh, were planned or uh, devised or actually saw action in historical battles around the Mediterranean in North Africa and in the Middle East and in China and India. Now, not all of these unconventional weapons fit our strict modern definitions of biological and chemical warfare, uh, the definitions that are current today. And some of these historical accounts could be legendary or they could record uh, intention. But these historical writings do represent the earliest evidence we have of the intention, the desire, the principles, and the actual practices that later evolved into modern biological and chemical weapons. Uh, just some definitions. Biological weapons are based on viable living organisms, uh, and uh, they tend to multiply in the body and increase in fatal effects. So it will be venoms, plant poisons, germs. Deploying animals and insects is another category of biological warfare. And one of the most ancient examples of a very simple but effective bioweapon was probably discovered very early in human history. Um, scholars point out that that would be hurling beehives or uh, nests full of furious wasps and hornets. And later during the Roman Empire, catapults were used sometimes to lob beehives at the enemy. What about the ancient history of chemical weapons? Chemical weapons uh, can be defined as poison gases, choking and blinding clouds of dust or smoke, and violently combustible materials that are not quenched by normal means, by water. Greek fire, uh, the Byzantine chemical incendiary weapon that was invented in the seventh century AD was based on naphtha, sulfur, and quicklime and some other ingredients. 
in antiquity, there were many early precursors of Greek fire, which uh, of course is a precursor of our uh, modern napalm. In the first century BC, a choking blinding cloud of caustic quicklime was created by the Roman commander Sertorius to defeat uh, his enemies in Spain. He stirred up a cloud, he used horses uh, to stir up a cloud of finely powdered limestone or quicklime, and this dust causes corrosive burning on contact with the eyes, nose, and throat. And he counted on the prevailing winds to blow this into the uh, eyes, nose, and mouth of the enemy when he began the battle. This very same lime dust technique was used in ancient China. Um, and it was also used in a naval battle between the English and the French in 1217. Uh, and note that the use of this weapon requires favorable winds or there could be serious blowback effects. One of the earliest historical instances of a poison gas uh, was described in the fifth century BC by Thucydides. During the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans attacked Plataea by creating an enormous fire outside the wall, and that was fueled with highly flammable pine resin. But the Spartan innovation was to toss in lumps of sulfur. Sulfur dioxide gas was the result came from the uh, fire. And once again, prevailing winds were very important. Um, I found uh, many other recipes for making poisonous smokes and clouds of corrosive dust in ancient Chinese, Indian, Greek, and Roman military handbooks. The sheer variety of biochemical options in antiquity is staggering. Besides arrows steeped in snake venom, germs, or plant poisons, ancient armies also could poison enemies' uh, water supplies or their wine or food with deadly toxins. Uh, this was done by Julius Caesar and several Carthaginian generals. At the earliest documented case of poisoning the water supply of a besieged city occurred during the first sacred war um, in Greece uh, against Kira in 590 BC. And for this incident, we have several ancient sources. So it really uh, uh, makes a convincing case that this was a well-known incident that happened in about 590 BC. In that case, uh, the sources tell us that the poison was hellebore, that powerful plant toxin that I, that I mentioned earlier. And notably, uh, some of the sources implicate a doctor in plotting this early use of biological warfare, which of course harmed non-combatants, uh, women and children inside the city, not just the soldiers were overrun and slaughtered. The Romans claimed to deplore such tactics, yet they too resorted to poisoning wells in Asia Minor. Another tactic was to force the enemy to camp in a malarial swamp. You didn't have to understand malaria, you just knew that it was, uh, you would be doomed if you camped in a particular wetlands. Other sources tell us of drugging enemy troops or booby trapping, temple treasures by hiding plague infected uh, materials such as cloth to infect any enemy looters. If the cloth had belonged to a smallpox victim, for instance, it could remain virulent for years. According to some Roman sources, the great plague during the reign of uh, Marcus Aurelius um, was brought back to Italy by his own army after they looted items from a sealed chest in a temple in Babylon. But once again, uh, we don't know if this is actually what happened, but the fact that some sources say this shows that in antiquity, this was thought to be plausible and was feared. Alexander the Great and his men encountered a simple but devastating unconventional chemical weapon in the fourth century BC. Uh, and this was during their uh, siege of uh, the Phoenician city of Tyre in what is now Lebanon. Uh, the Phoenicians inside the besieged city heated fine sand in shallow bronze bowls. And then they catapulted this red hot sand down onto 
Alexander's army from the, from the walls. And ancient historians des describe the terrible scene as the hot burning grains of sand uh, went into their flesh and burned several inches deep. This primitive burning shrapnel anticipates the fatal deep burns that are inf inflicted by modern thermite or white phosphorus bombs, uh, which also depend on burning, tiny burning particulates that uh, pierce the body by several inches. And this was not invented until 2000 years after Alexander. I mentioned that besides insects, animals were also weaponized in antiquity. In the Hellenistic period, after Alexander uh, uh, brought back elephants from India, every large army in, uh, in the Mediterranean area uh, was training Indian elephants to serve as living tanks. And war elephants became sort of the glamour weapon. They had a great terror advantage, of course, but they also opposed a very serious friendly fire potential because elephants could run amok and trample their own side. Um, Alexander the Great, according to an ancient legend, was the first to discover a, a counter weapon to repel war elephants when he was in India. And uh, this was uh, the idea that elephants panicked at the sight, the smell, and the sound of pigs. And uh, several historical accounts tell us that pigs were successful defensive weapons in the heyday of war elephants, causing them to run amok. The last recorded pig versus elephant battle that I could find occurred in the sixth century AD reported by Procopius when the Romans deflected one single Persian war elephant with one squealing pig. Poison arrows were by far uh, the most popular uh, biological weapons in antiquity and around the world. A vast variety of substances from poisonous plants to snake venom to stingray spines, toxic insect uh, guts have been used uh, around the globe to poison projectiles. In antiquity, the Gauls were known to tip their arrows with henbane and hellebore and uh, their archers carried antidotes ready to treat any accidental self-injury to avoid the problems encountered by the Greek mythic heroes. Pliny the Elder uh, remarked that ancient Romans used to dip their spears in deadly nightshade. And the old Latin name for that plant means, translates as spear poison. The most feared biological warriors of antiquity uh, were the Scythians, nomads of the Eurasian steppes. And not only were they expert archers, but it was said that their arrows were tipped with Scythicon, a notorious arrow drug. And the Roman poet Ovid wrote that, uh, that to make the wounds twice as deadly, Scythians dip in viper's venom every arrow tip. And of course, poisonous snakes were deeply dreaded in antiquity. And there were many deadly species. The Scythian nomads could uh, use uh, several different uh, species of viper, uh, the venom of sand or steppe vipers, uh, the Caucasus viper, or the European adder, all of them pictured here. Facing uh, Scythians uh, reputed to be using uh, snake venom arrows would be an especially harrowing uh, notion, and it was especially daunting because the Scythicon recipe was much worse than just mere snake venom on the tip of the arrow. We have several ancient Greek and Roman sources that relate that the Scythians mixed up a nasty concoction of dead poison vipers, venom, human blood mixed with dung, put in a leather bag and buried in the ground and allowed to putrefy uh, for several months, and then they dip their arrows in that. A slight scratch from one of these arrows would mean a ghastly death or a slow, uh, slow death or torture from a wound that was infected with gangrene and tetanus. So a battle against Scythians would be quite daunting. 
Their recipes for creating horrid poisons from deadly snakes in India were also reported. According to the natural historian Elian, um, writing about AD 200, uh, one of the most feared poisons of India was derived from the so-called purple snake from the hottest part of Asia. According to Elian, this snake had a dark purple body and a head as white as milk. It was said to be very docile, very tame, not aggressive. But Elian gives a detailed description that allows us to figure out the identity of this mysterious purple snake. A herpetologist uh, from Villanova helped me identify it. It turns out there's only one tropical snake in the world that has a dark uh, purplish body and a white head. The Azemiops viper was discovered uh, in Asia by scientists, modern scientists, in about 1880. It is poisonous, but it's very docile, as Elian said. And Elian says that collecting purple snake poison was difficult um, and kind of dangerous to extract the venom. The snake was suspended alive, head down over a bronze pot to catch the dripping venom, which congealed into a thick sort of yellowish uh, gum or gel. And when the snake finally died, the first pot was replaced with another to catch the liquid flowing from the rotting dead snake. And after three days, this foul liquid gelled into a deep black substance. The two poisons were kept separate. Elian says they killed in two different ways. The black sludge caused a lingering wasting death and the amber colored poison caused a violent uh, uh, series of convulsions. And then says Elian, the victim died a terrible death as his brain dissolved and dripped out his nose. And now I assume everyone's feeling really queasy and that reaction was exactly the intention of poison arrow makers in Scythia, who uh, obviously uh, told a lot of people about the recipe of their Scythicon uh, and uh, the fact that Elian knows the recipe and the results of the poison snake venom from India. Just dipping arrows in pure venom, that'd be deadly enough. Um, but soaking them your arrows and the most grotesque poisons and then broadcasting the disgusting recipes and symptoms to your potential enemies was and remains an important psychological aspect of biological warfare. The very idea of facing uh, archers supplied with Scythicon or purple snake poison would have been a horrifying prospect and that, uh, that uh, approach of broadcasting your possession of biological weapons is uh, part of psychological warfare today. But the element of surprise could also be effective. Uh, Alexander the Great in 327 uh, and his men faced uh, dangers as they marched through India. Uh, outside Harmatelia in Pakistan, they met a new and grave danger. Uh, Diodorus says that the Harmatelians had smeared their weapons with a uh, mortal drug. And his description is vivid. Uh, the wounded men went numb, then they suffered stabbing pains and convulsions, and their skin became cold and pale, and then they vomited up bile. Black froth oozed from the wound, and then purple gangrene spread rapidly, bringing a terrible death. And it was remarkable, said Diodorus, that even a mere scratch brought the same gruesome death to Alexander's men. Well, the Greeks were baffled and demoralized, uh, but the Hindu doctors that were traveling with Alexander's army, they immediately recognized the symptoms of snake bite. And they realized that the people of Harmatelia had coated their arrows with the venom of a deadly viper. This is what Diodorus tells us. Now, because India is so famous for its cobras, modern historians have assumed that it was probably cobra venom. But in fact, death from cobra venom is uh, relatively painless. Uh, you die from respiratory paralysis. And my herpetological consultant, Aaron Bauer, uh, concluded from Diodorus's and other historians' descriptions that the venom came from a different snake, just as deadly, called the Russell's viper, uh, responsible for numerous deaths in India and Pakistan today. The venom uh, causes exactly the same symptoms described by Alexander's historians. And I mentioned earlier, that the Romans were not above using poison weapons and tactics. 
that exploited the biological vulnerabilities of their foes. But the Romans were unprepared for the inventive ploys and awesome chemical incendiaries used by the fortified cities that they besieged uh, in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, for the Romans, petroleum and naphtha were mysterious, rare substances. But in Mesopotamia, since about 900 BC, the people of Mesopotamia had found myriad uses for the sticky flammable oil that seeped from the sand, including military applications. Petroleum fire was first used against a Western army in the first century BC in the Roman wars in the Middle East. Roman historians uh, struggle to describe, uh, find words to describe the new chemical incendiary uh, that they were encountering in the Middle East. According to Pliny the Elder, the defenders of Samosata, a city on the Euphrates, uh, had a secret weapon. Pliny called it a flammable mud that came from nearby pools. Once it is ignited, marveled Pliny, it's impossible to quench with water. The Roman siege of Samosata uh, in 68 BC failed miserably because the, their soldiers' armor and bodies were melting in the intense heat of the burning naphtha that was being uh, poured down from the walls of Samosata. That same year, another Roman historian reported that at Tigrano Serta, Tigrano Curta, on the to the Tigris River, you can see just uh, east of Samosata in this map, the barbarians, quote, have an extraordinary chemical that burns up whatever it touches and cannot be extinguished. The, fleam, uh, the streams of flaming, flowing naphtha consume the Roman siege machines and incinerated the soldiers. A combination of corrosive fire and venomous creatures was deployed against the Romans in AD 199. Yet another attempt to control the Asian provinces, the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus twice tried to storm Hatra, the stronghold uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the confluence of the trade routes in uh, the desert of Northern Iraq, not far from the town of Mosul. And here are the ruins of that fortress. You see it's completely surrounded by desert. Hold up by, uh, in their fortified city, the citizens of Hatra planned their defense as the Roman legions advanced across the desert. Their first weapon was chemical. They used uh, collected burning naphtha from nearby oil fields. Roman historians reported that a remarkable sticky substance enveloped the Roman army in searing flames as they were preparing their siege, forcing Septimius Severus to retreat. Well, Hatra's other defense was biological. Severus was preparing his second attack on Hatra and the people of Hatra had already collected hundreds of stinging scorpions and other insects from the desert and they packed them into sealed clay pots. Scorpions were deeply feared in antiquity, especially the giant species of the Middle East. So let's imagine the scene at Hatra. Just as the Romans were about to breach the city walls using ladders, uh, the defenders above began hurling down the clay pots full of scorpions. And as the clay pots uh, shattered on their armor and ladders, quote, the rain of hideous insects fell onto the exposed skin of the soldiers. And this comes from the Roman historian Herodian. And digging in, he says, they bit and stung the men. Um, this is a, a, an actual x-ray of a clay pot filled with live scorpions from Iraq. Uh, National Geographic recreated this scorpion bomb from Hatra for the special issue on, uh, on poisons. The terror effect, if you think about it, just the terror effect alone would have been horrifying no matter how many men were actually stung. Um, the combined defense to tactics, uh, tactics of Hatra 
first chemical fire and then scorpion grenades, probably accompanied by naphtha, uh, caused Severus to actually give up his siege in less than a month for, quote, fear his entire army would be destroyed. Now, that is a, is a rare thing for a Roman army. They usually stuck out their sieges and they usually won, even if it took them years. Well, this has just been a partial list of uh, the many ways that nature was weaponized in the ancient world. Uh, all these tactics and more, um, some of them are rather crude, but others are quite sophisticated. All these tactics were reported in the literature of Greece, Rome, and there are reports from India and China as well. And you notice that all of these weapons and strategies were conceived of without modern scientific knowledge, of course. All that was required uh, was experience, um, observation, diabolical uh, creativity. Uh, I think my my screen is uh, stuttering, I'll say that sentence again. All that was really required was experience, observation, diabolical creativity, and a willingness to resort to unfair, underhanded weapons fashioned from whatever natural resources were at hand. And that is the innovation of these kinds of unconventional weapons. But wielding weapons uh, that are based on lethal poisons, on volatile chemicals, uh, wind-borne clouds of smoke or dust, uh, unquenchable flames, liquid fire, virulent pathogens, toxic creatures, uh, unpredictable animals. Wielding those kind of weapons and using those tactics poses dangers not just to the victims, but to the perpetrators themselves. Uh, and this boomerang th uh, threat uh, was just what the ancient Greek myths had warned about with the story of, uh, of Heracles' hydra weapons. You're, moreover, they, um, these kind of weapons can also uh, harm non-combatants. So there's a high chance of that. Moreover, in cultures that value bravery and military training, Toxic weapons were often viewed as the equivalent of a cowardly ambush. And yet, we know that those same warrior cultures also admire clever ruses of war. Uh, so despite this general sense that biological weapons were cruel and somehow dishonorable, they were sometimes rationalized uh, in certain circumstances. And the justifications, I think, will sound very familiar to us uh, today. When one was outnumbered or facing troops that are, were uh, superior in skill, bravery, superior in technology, uh, biological strategies give a real advantage. Desperate cities that were under siege resorted to biological options to pre protect them themselves, and I'm gonna say that again because I see my screen is stuck. Desperate cities under siege also resort to biological options uh, at times to protect themselves from invaders. Sometimes generals order biochemical strategies out of frustration uh, with long sieges and stalemates or to avoid casualties or they might want to avoid the uncertainties of a fair fight. They're avoiding face-to-face -face combat. Holy wars are sacred wars. They encourage the ruthless killing of civilians as well as soldiers. So there are no qualms against using uh, biological chemical weapons. Whenever a population is identified as uncivilized or barbarians or somehow less than human, there were few qualms about using inhumane weapons. And in some cultures, ambush and poison arrows were just the customary way of making war, similar to hunting. Well, contemplating the history of turning so many destructive natural forces into uh, insidious weaponry, it's a rather melancholy uh, endeavor uh, to study and to hear about. The evidence from ancient myth and history shatters uh, the notion that there were were ever times 
when biological and chemical warfare was unthinkable. But the evidence also shows that doubts about the use of such weapons arose as soon as the first archer dipped his arrow in poison. And I think that could be a reason for hope. So I'll conclude with another little glimmer of hope uh, taken from the legends that grew up around Heracles' Hydra venom arrows. At the beginning of my talk, I described what happened to the archer uh, Philoctetes, who in the myth inherited Heracles' quiver of poison arrows and then experienced the dire effects firsthand when he was on the desert island. After the Greek victory in the Trojan War, the war veteran Philoctetes wandered around the Mediterranean with his bow and arrows fighting as a mercenary before settling in Italy. But at the end of his life, the legend is that the old warrior chose not to pass on the terrible poison weapons uh, to the next generation as Heracles had done for him. Instead, uh, the legend says that Philoctetes dedicated his bow and arrows in a temple of Apollo, the god of heating, healing. Remarkably, uh, I think it's uh, remarkable that the it's the ancient myth uh, that offers a kind of model for ending the cycle of tragedy begun by Heracles. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Mayer. That was a wonderful presentation. It was very interesting to hear the details of how this type of warfare was uh, used. And we do have a couple of questions from the chat if you would like to go over those. Uh, can you read me the questions? Yes, ma'am, I absolutely can. Okay. So the first question was, what precautions would ancient people take when handling these poisons or diseased animals and materials in order to reduce exposure to themselves? Um, well, if you're um, talking about Greek fire, uh, which was the most dreaded uh, weapon in the Byzantine era, people did try to devise uh, ways of protecting themselves. They would drape the sides of their ship with wet uh, cow hides uh, to somehow deflect uh, the fire, but uh, there was really no way to protect their the wood uh, masts and the, uh, and the sails. So there really wasn't any defense against Greek fire, which is why it was so dreaded. On the other hand, uh, I talked about Plataea when uh, the Spartans built uh, the huge fire outside the walls. And we also know that Persians and other ancient armies used fire arrows against uh, soldiers on the, on the walls of cities. In that case, draping the walls with wet hides did actually protect uh, cities from fire arrows and uh, dis destruction of their walls. So, so there were those sorts of precautions against incendiaries. Um, other peoples, uh, as I mentioned, the Celts and the, um, and the Gauls who used uh, plant poisons, they uh, tried to have uh, antidotes handy uh, in case of, uh, if, if they were fighting other Gauls, uh, they, against uh, those poison weapons of, of people that they knew were using the same weapons as themselves, but it also protected them against self-injury from their own arrows. Um, in the case of the Scythians, we know that they had a special sort of uh, uh, quiver called a goritos, which had two compartments. Uh, one compartment was for the bow and one compartment was for uh, the arrows. And uh, it's interesting that um, archeologists uh, who have, uh, excavated Scythian graves, find lots of arrowheads, but that in some cases they also find uh, shafts of arrows and they are painted in, here's an example, the arrows are painted with zigzag lines and uh, uh, curved lines uh, that resemble the snake uh, snakes that they used for the Scythicon. Um, so the theory is that in this way, they would know which arrows were poisoned and then which ones were not, so that they could be extra careful with the with the poisoned ones. Um, so I, uh, other than attempting to have antidotes against various poisons, I don't really know if there were any uh, um, other ways of protecting yourself against these 
weapons. And of course, I did write a book called The Poison King about Mithridates, uh, who was so afraid of, of poisoning that he worked on a, on a universal antidote. Um, I don't think any ancient armies had access to that kind of protection, however. Very interesting, thank you. So for the next question, uh, somebody asked, is there evidence around that time period that regarded anything about microdosing on poisons to de develop immunity to them? Yes, that would um, that goes directly to Mithridates' uh, plan to make himself a, a universal uh, antidote that was supposed to um, jumpstart his immune system by taking microdoses of every known poison and venom and plant toxin, and along with its antidote and. Pliny the Elder, after uh, after Mithridates was defeated by the Romans, all of Mithridates' notes and archives about that uh, antidote were taken to Rome. And Pliny the Elder, we know, had access to all of those. And he says that Mithridates was the first to, for a theriac or antidote uh, in antiquity, he was the first to not only uh, use antidotes, but use tiny um, portions of the poisons themselves in combination with their antidotes uh, to make himself immune. So, so that idea did exist in antiquity. Um, and we know that Mithridates was very well read in many other languages. And there's a, a possibility that he had heard of this concept of microdoses with poisons and antidotes from uh, India. Wow, that's, he, he sounds like he took uh, his worry about poison being poisoned incredibly seriously. He certainly um, did. <laughs> one other question from the chat is, are there records of deaths or injuries uh, during the production of these weapons? For example, uh, are there records of people being injured or harmed when capturing snakes or scorpions? Um, not, uh, not for capturing snakes or scorpions, but it's interesting that there were uh, ancient texts that told me, told one how to capture scorpions without getting stung. And I was the advisor to the National Geographic when they were making that uh, authentic clay pot from Hatra and putting live Iraqi scorpions inside. They hadn't thought ahead of uh, what they were going to do. How were they going to put the live scorpions? And these are giant six inch long scorpions that they got from a exotic pet shop in Rhode Island, took to Washington, D.C., and now they're asking a photographer to <laughs> take a photograph of them inside of a pot. So I pointed out that in antiquity, one uh, method was to drug them with hellebore enough to put them to sleep and then put them in the pot and then wake them up with another plant that wasn't mentioned in the text, unfortunately. So the other uh, method that they could have used was to spit very carefully onto the scorpion's stinger, which then uh, clogs the stinger so that you can pick them up and not be uh, uh, stung. And they didn't want to do that. So they hit on putting the scorpions in a refrigerator or the freezer for a couple hours before they put it in the pot. That's not available in, in antiquity. Um, but uh, I think the idea of uh, knocking them out uh, and then reviving them was probably what was used. Now there were also reports of people getting injured when they were trying to make Greek fire. So that we, we have a lot of texts that, uh, Byzantine texts that talk about all the precautions that you need to take when you're making Greek fire. And of course we don't have the recipe, nor do we understand exactly how they distilled a volatile naphtha or how they put it under pressure and how they then were able to blast it at other ships without thermometers or pressure gauges or anything like that. So I think there were a lot of accidents and those accidents are alluded to in the ancient texts. That's incredibly interesting. And I will say that the Greek fire is something that is incredibly uh, fascinating in terms of exactly what you described. Um, yeah. One other question was that, is there a specific real poison or venom that would connect with the poison that was seen in the stories of Heracles, Philoctetes, and the other uh, myths that you mentioned? Like, for example, in Pharsalia, Lucan, 
uh, provides names to the snake and very explicitly describes how Roman soldiers are uh, afflicted when they're bitten, which has given um, scholars the ability to kind of determine what types of snake those uh, serpents may have been. Do we have that kind of insight with some of these Greek myths? Uh, not with the uh, mythological snakes. We don't know which snake uh, uh, was thought to have uh, figured in the in those stories in the myth. But uh, we know that the, mentioning the Romans, uh, the Romans in North Africa, of course, really feared snake bite, and they hired the Psylli, uh, P S Y L L I, a tribe that were known as snake handlers, and they were known to be. Uh, immune to some snake bites because of perhaps encountering them as children, who knows, but they were known to be able to treat snake bite just like uh, the Hindu doctors who accompanied Alexander. So in, in those two cases with the Romans and Alexander, we, we are able from the descriptions to know which snakes uh, were involved. Um, Greece, Greece has venomous, venomous vipers and um, uh, and so I suppose that, that it was just a general idea for the myths. Okay, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Thank yeah. you so much for well, your you. time today. This presentation was incredibly insightful. Um, I know you haven't been able to see the chat, but it's been going. People have been very oh. interested and invested. So thank, thank you, you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed all the other papers. So what a great conference. Thank you. Thank you.